has that shiny new addition to the collection smell. This car is 58 years old, but it just rolled through the doors at stalls. It is as rare as, dare we say, exotic. Behold, the infamous Chrysler Turbine car. A world of wonder, where fantastical music machines provide the soundtrack for a tantalizing stroll through history. Vintage automobiles and memorabilia stimulate the senses around every chromed curve and corner. This is Inside Stalls. Automotive world may be going electric, but the development of alternative fuel source cars is nothing new. Beginning in 1953, Chrysler and engineer George Huebner were committed to developing a turbine engine powered car. Over the course of 23 years, Chrysler developed six dozen turbine cars. Today, only nine remain, and you're looking at one of them the 1963 Chrysler Turbine. This is chassis 991231 and was owned by former Tigers owner and Domino's pizza mogul Tom Monahan. It sits on original tires and wheels and is capable of making 130 horsepower and cruising comfortably at 70 miles per hour. The distinctive whooshing sound of the turbine engine is unmistakable. Actually, it sounds more like this. This car will be run and driven just as all the vehicles at stalls are, but the question is on what fuel source. The turbine could run on anything that burned, even this stuff. <coughs> the whole concept behind the turbine powered car should have worked. It promised advantages over the pistons powered engines because it used fewer moving parts. And with spinning versus reciprocating parts, it featured a smoother running engine. But a thing of beauty, it was not. It had a very atom bomb feel to it. It even made the LS motor look good. The design of the car itself was unique. Elwood Angle was hired from Ford to create something that accentuated the turbines. It was futuristic and aeronautical in nature, from its airplane-inspired gauges to the distinctive rear end that looks like it could be something straight out of Top Gun. Turbine engine exhaust ports. Right, not exactly. These are backup lights. The exhaust is located underneath the car, but that was the idea, to make it look like a jet engine was running through the entire vehicle. To drum up interest in his turbine cars, George Hubner drove across country in one of them. Everywhere he stopped drew huge crowds and media attention. Everybody wanted to get a glimpse of the jet engine car. The popularity and desire from the public to own one of the cars eventually led to Chrysler to build the cars and distribute them to the public for free on a three-month trial basis. A total of 55 cars were built. 50, the famous 50, were distributed across a wide demographic of the car buying public. From 1963 to 1966, 203 people were selected to drive the car for three months and were asked to evaluate its performance. If your family had one, you suddenly had a lot of new friends and relatives eager for a glimpse or a ride. The cars themselves were celebrities. You look marvelous, darling. Every turbine, with the exception of one, was blessed with a gorgeous tan. Turbine bronze, they called it. They wanted the color to immediately identify the turbine as something different on the road. But as the cars crisscrossed the country, covering a combined one million miles, it became obvious the turbine was different. It didn't accelerate as quickly as its conventional counterparts, and the fuel economy wasn't as good as that of pistons-powered engines. It was also expensive to produce. At $10,000, it was almost three times more than the average mid-range vehicle at the time. As promising as the turbine concept was, there was also a little tax problem. The bodies were created and assembled by Ghia in Italy and then shipped to the States. If it was to become a full-time production vehicle, Chrysler was going to have to be on the hook for a significant import tax. The only way around that was to destroy the prototypes. So 46 of the 55 turbine cars made were sent to their crushed and fiery graves in a junkyard in Romulus, Michigan. 
Chrysler continued with its turbine program until the early 80s when the fuel crisis, emission standards, and a desire for smaller, more fuel-efficient cars altered the marketplace. Finally, in 1983, 25 years after the first turbine car was built in Highland Park, the program came to an end. So what happened to the remaining turbine cars? Five ended up in museums. Chrysler still owns two. Jay Leno has one. So does the Smithsonian, the Peterson Museum, and the St. Louis Museum of Transportation. The other three reside here in Michigan, including this one right here at Stalls, where it looks completely at home alongside all of its stylish, sophisticated, and fascinating friends.